I apologize ahead of time if this video is not specifically and only related to video games. Because, you know, we actually live in a really complex society where video games don't just exist in their own little bubble and have to share the world with everyone else's problems. Anyways, the specific problem here is internet data bandwidth caps. This video is about internet service providers selling internet access with a limit on how much data you can access with their service. Uh, kind of like how cell phone companies sell you a data plan that you can't go over on your phone, home internet providers are now wanting to sell you a data plan like that for your house. For years, ISPs have been trying this on an on and off basis, but the issue never really affected me personally until last December, when Comcast rolled out a 300 gigabyte data plan for my region, as opposed to the previous data plan which was unlimited and therefore not much of a data plan at all. Since it's a service that I, and millions of other customers, have been reliably paying for years, and since it suddenly got turned into a worse service for the same price with no warning, I decided to send Comcast an email voicing my concerns. I asked if this new data plan was temporary, why they settled on 300 gigabytes, what tiers of service are affected, and how they expect to deal with customers who go over that data cap. And surprisingly enough, they actually got back to me. The first few sentences of the reply advise me not to use the word cap, as it implies a fixed hard limit which Comcast does not have. What we're piloting in Atlanta, and in other markets, is a 300 gigabyte monthly data plan with the ability for heavy data users to purchase additional buckets of 50 gigabytes for $10 each. Each. So I guess he's right. It's not a hard limit, even though I still don't see why the word cap would not be used to describe the softer limit, but here's a more appropriate term that those of us who are into video games should know very well. It's a microtransaction. It's $10 for a bucket of 50 more gigabytes. It's a small incremental payment of an overage charge. And figuring out how close you are to going over is a bit of a complicated process for your average customer. And your average customer is faced with an internet that is becoming full of very demanding services. And this is where my next question comes in. How did they specifically settle on 300 gigabytes? We chose 300 gigabytes because it is an extraordinarily large amount of data. About 98% of our customers don't consume that much data in a month. To give you some context, our customers' median monthly data use is about 18 gigabytes. So besides noticing the inherent problems with trying to represent 22 million customers with one median number, I think that the second problem with this response is that most of the people watching this program are probably going to think that 300 gigabytes of data is not an extraordinarily large amount of data. And the reason why is video games. This is where video games come in. The Xbox One and PlayStation 4 both come equipped with hardware for streaming videos of games online as they are being played. The PS4 will soon handle backwards compatibility by streaming you a video of you playing games remotely. And compared to your basic internet browsing, those high-resolution video files are very, very large files, and they can quickly fill up that cap. And streaming them to you fast enough for you to comfortably play games through them just increases the size of that data even further. So in order to test whether or not 300 gigabytes actually is an extraordinarily large amount of data, I downloaded a free bandwidth meter and left a few of those video programs running. Here's what I found out. An hour of 720p Netflix footage is just under 1 gigabyte. An hour of 720p Twitch gameplay is just under 2 gigabytes. But the mother load comes from an hour of playing games through video streaming, which on OnLive takes up a whopping 7 gigabytes. And this is pretty similar to what you can expect the PlayStation service to look like. If you're gonna rely on a streaming service to play games, you're gonna have to ration that stuff off pretty hard. But these next-gen consoles encourage you to do that stuff on a daily basis. And while those first two numbers might sound low, remember that the data cap is totaled up for the entire household that's using that internet. One person probably isn't going to watch hundreds of hours of Netflix by themselves, but when you divide that up between a household of four people, you might get an idea of just how possible it is to run an overage charge on this stuff. And in the future, when 4K resolutions become more normal, those file sizes are going to increase four times. And actually, a bigger reason why I think 300 gigabytes is not that much is because game downloads are getting really, really big these days. Uh, the Call of Duty Ghosts is 37 gigabytes. Killzone Shadowfall is 37 gigabytes. And if those games are only going to be getting bigger as the next generation rolls on, then we shouldn't be putting up with such a low precedent right now. 
After all these years of cutting corners to fit games on DVDs, developers now have to deal with bandwidth caps. They decrease the size of games while also discouraging customers from spending time and money on their product. They limit the growth of digital distribution, they limit the customer's buying power, and they limit the potential that gaming has to grow online. And just one of the many reasons why the original design for the Xbox One got so much backlash is because of these bandwidth caps themselves. Microsoft has changed their entire plans for a whole generation because people were not comfortable with the idea of relying on a device that could so easily fill up their cap. For a full household of people who all enjoy the internet, 300 gigabytes is oftentimes not going to be enough. So back in that email, it then explains that this data cap is applied to all pricing tiers of their residential services, but it does voice some reluctance in the plan. The writer refers to it as a pilot program, and it also claims that as the internet evolves, so will Comcast's policies. So maybe that means they're open to raising that cap later on. But the idea of 300 gigabytes being fair is just underestimating their legitimate customers. Even if they're a minority of customers, they are still legitimate customers. A couple of roommates who do a lot of streaming, and video games as a hobby leads you into doing a lot of streaming, are going to have trouble using those services and also downloading those very big games. As I mentioned above, only about 2% of our customers today consume more than 300 gigabytes of data in a single month, so we think this pilot approach is a fair one. It enables those who want to use more data the option to do so. No, no it doesn't. That's wrong. It gives Comcast the option of charging people for more data. If you want to pay the advertised amount for internet that you signed up for, you can't go over this cap. Your usage of their service is limited, and that's not an option for us customers. We just have to deal with it. It's a hidden charge. It's also worth noting that we're piloting another program for very light data users, which we define as consuming less than 5 gigabytes per month. If they want to opt in, then they can save $5 per month off their bill. I wonder if he knows that Right now, there are services in the UK that are similar that cost less than $5 a month. That sounds crazy to Americans, but people in the UK and much of Europe have way cheaper internet. The average broadband service in the UK that's comparable to the average service in the USA costs just $6 a month. And the reason for that is competition. Back in 2000, European customers had to deal with a similar duopoly that Americans deal with. Their choices for internet service either boiled down to the phone company or the cable company. But over the past decade, government agencies have been bringing Europeans more choices by encouraging healthier capitalism, by forcing that duopoly to let smaller companies use their lines. As a result, you see cheaper options both for heavy use and light use. You see post offices and supermarkets selling internet along alongside specialized companies that only sell internet. The kind of regulation that you see for Europe's broadband market never happened for America's. In fact, the government agencies here seem awfully friendly with the companies that they're supposed to be regulating. Michael Powell, a former FCC boss, is now the cable industry's chief lobbyist. He's the president of the National Cable and Telecommunication Association, and he made headlines earlier this year by claiming that bandwidth caps are there to, quote, fairly monetize a high fixed cost. Meredith Atwell Baker was also a former FCC commissioner when she left the government before her term to work as a senior official for Comcast. This happened months after she voted to approve the 2011 merger between Comcast and NBC, and now she's doing government work on behalf of Comcast. So anyways, I took my concerns online and sought out a few experts to help explain how the internet works, and that just made this situation look even more ridiculous. Customers viewing large amounts of data shouldn't really be a problem for an ISP. Data being sent through the internet doesn't lay around and congest things. It's broken up into thousands of little packets, and because of the protocols that all internet communication works with, those packets only congest at their destination, which is the storage space on the client side, not the ISP's side. Anyways, the protocols that internet communications work under have flow control mechanisms in place that automatically slow down communication if that's needed. And that is needed. There's a lot of raw processing power and some very impressive engineering feats required to make the internet work. But, like I said, the data that it processes does not stick around for long. The limitations lie more on the side of processing power and less on the side of there being physical limits to bandwidth. If lots of people want to continually process data at the same time, that's going to tax a lot of the local hardware on Comcast's end. And that's why Comcast slows down at peak hours. 
The actual process of sending online data through wires across the world doesn't actually have a lot of value associated with it. Much of that process is automated. It does require an overhead cost of electricity and maintenance going to a building full of fancy equipment, but that specific process of sending data through the internet doesn't burn up any natural resources or employ a whole lot of physical labor to work. In fact, independent research tends to suggest that it actually costs Comcast about two cents to send one gigabyte of data, which would mean that my 300 gigabyte $50 service should cost more like six dollars, like how they have it in Europe. Until some higher power out there figures out how to break up this duopoly, all of us peasant customers have to deal with Comcast kicking and screaming their way to irrelevancy. They also sell TV service, and they earn a lot of money from the ad revenues of local commercials that they inject into cable channels. So what this is, is their underhanded and unfair way of trying to become a middleman for TV's competitors. And one of TV's biggest competitors, and some of the most demanding internet services out there, are all about video games.